Have you ever felt? Are you listening? Welcome. I want to thank you for coming uh, and viewing this today with me. Uh, I hope to quickly go over some of the terms you'll be needing to know for this AP Human Geography class. I know you're excited. I'm excited. We're all very excited. So first, this is from Unit 1, Introduction to Human Geography, the inter Interrelations of Places and Terms. Before we go any farther, our featured figure today is Dr. John Snow, who I think everyone knows is a medical geographer and demographer. Uh, he's the one that debunked the popular myth that you got cholera by being a terrible, terrible, sinful person and poor. He actually realized that uh, these strange voodoo-type myths were silly and we needed some, maybe some science or geography. So he actually went out and mapped all the instances of cholera. You can see that uh, where the red dots are. He mapped all of them in Soho and he realized from doing this that, hey, this is actually a tainted tap, which is probably the name of a terrible metal band. A tainted tap, and if you got water from it, mostly it would be um, the source of your cholera and your epidemic. So hopefully you got it from a different tap. Uh, we can see our two questions from previous day's studies, because I know we all did these previously. The type of thematic map here, remember all thematic maps tell a story. The story being told here is where are the instances of uh, cholera and it is a proportional dot map. We notice the dots get bigger as the intensity of the phenomenon increases. Secondly, as a geographer, what can you deduce from this? Well, you should deduce what exactly he got is cholera is a waterborne disease, not a sin-borne disease. All right, and that's our featured figure today, Dr. John Snow. All right, let's get to some terms. Uh, we're gonna be learning how Everywhere in the world is connected, this interrelations of places, and it's essentially broken down by this two-word phrase, distance decay. All right. So what you should know with distance decay is that everything is related to everything else. Now, don't go ahead and dump your boyfriend or girlfriend thinking, oh, no, we're first, second, third, fourth, maybe fifth cousins. Not like that. What it's saying is it's kind of the butterfly effect. Everything is connected. Some have a stronger connection, right? Some have a weaker connection, but this level of interaction, right, gets higher and higher and higher and higher as you get closer and closer and closer, right? And the level of interaction as you get farther away dwindles. Uh, it never approaches zero, so remember, keep that in mind. Um, that is the basic law of geography, that everything is related to everything else, and that is known as distance decay. Two other terms we'll be using are sight and situation. We'll start left to right. Sight is basically what have humans done to an area, right? And what is it actually like in this area? Sometimes it's known as absolute location, but it means what is the climate, the topography, uh, the water sources, the vegetation. You literally want to know what is it like there, exactly like, what does it look like? You can see the land, the creeks, the ponds, etc., roads. Situation to the right, another name for this would be relative location. So you're trying to describe a place using another place. So let's say you want to know what school's like in Gan Luis, Denmark, right? Well, maybe you go to Duluth High School like I do, and you know what Duluth is like, and I can tell you, well, they're similar, right? And so this will give you the situation because it's saying that although you have no idea what it's like there in Denmark, unless you're well traveled, you can connect it knowing it's got a diverse population, uh, it's fairly affluent, um, things of that nature. So that's site and situation. So site, absolute location, situation, relative location. Some other words you'll need to know, sequent occupants. Now this phrase can be best uh, exemplified by the things on the right. So sequent occupants is, you look at two words. So it's how have people been occupying the land and how have they changed the land over time? So the sequence, how is the land changing? So you have the land, the land starts out like this, right? It's always gonna look like this. And then you have the natives and the explorers come in. And you'll notice the water is here on the right and the deep, right, deep area in the, in the center. And uh, the explorers don't move much past this area 
after a time, the sequent occupants began to change. We'll go from stage one to stage two. Now you have pioneer stage. You have people pushing further and further inland, right? Maybe they're seeking um, more land, uh, better resources, uh, less restrictive control. The third stage would be all of a sudden the humans have changed the the uh, the land in order to kind of move towards animal husbandry or to build factories, something to mass produce. All right, and the third or fourth one would be um, <coughs> excuse me, three, two, and the fourth one would be the uh, the mid to late industrialism. So it's how are humans changing with this footprint? So we see early on, right, the land doesn't have much of a footprint. Then one stage of humans come, the pioneers, they change it. Then you have the farmers, then you have the industrialist, right? So it's how is the sequence of occup occupiers change the land? That is the sequent occupants. Now I'm going to give you a quick little pop quiz. Now don't freak out because I know we all did the reading last night, but here's a piece of land that we're going to look at its sequent occupants. All right, here's this piece of land in 1600. Here it is in 1664 with, uh, these are Dutch pioneers. So that's your first hint. Then 1750, 1850, everyone's probably has a pretty good idea of what it is in present day. The sequent occupants described here is New York City. Ding, ding, ding. That is correct. Now, we can look at it in another application. So we can look at this one area of the grassland. So kind of before human, right? Then the natives come. The natives adapt to the land. The natives hunt on the land, right? Then the, uh, the Americans start building railroads, right? They start ranching. They start mining. They start exploiting. So it's basically how has the land changed and who is occupying it? So it goes from unoccupied to one occupancy group to multiple occupancy groups and many different processes. That is sequent occupants. Accessibility and connectivity. Accessibility is basically how easy or difficult is it to get somewhere. So let's say uh, you and a friend want to go right out to eat, right? You'll probably consider how accessible is it, right? If there's traffic, right? There's a bridge out, there's road work, something like that. You'll probably not choose that path and you'll choose another path. Same thing occurs with um, like rivers and mountains and deserts. It's how accessible is it, right? And this is a factor in determining whether an interaction will occur, like per perhaps trade, right? Connectivity is kind of kind of piggybacks on accessibility because it's physically how are we connected, right? So in the top, it's typically we're connected by roads, streams, canals. Um, uh, we're also connected by airports. They're a little harder to see. And the most intangible thing is, right, communication, right? Cell phones, internet. Because uh, people are technically connected, even though you cannot see the the connection. So those are types of connectivity for inter interactions between humans. Now moving on to spatial diffusion and distribution. Spatial diffusion is sounds very difficult. So spatial is this idea that there's space, and diffusion is things are moving across it. So think of the world as the space, but it can be even bigger than that. And to give you an idea. Uh, so it's moving an idea or an object, right? It's diffusing. So we all, we love these hipsters we see, right? And gentrifying places, taking pictures of their food instead of eating it, right? They are actually interacting with spatial diffusion. They take a picture, right? They put it on social media, right? Maybe two or three people see it, right? Maybe a few other people see it and it keeps spreading and spreading and spreading. And what this hipster needs to realize is that no one actually cares, right? Eat your breakfast, right? Distribution. Now, looking to the right, we see a map of the distribution of all the people in the world. So each dot is 100,000 people. We can see that most of the people in the world like living near the ocean, right? Or on rivers. Um, and we don't like it where it's too cold or too hot or too mountainous. Now, later in the course, we'll learn where these places are and what that's called, but you can see that most people in the world live on a river or near the water. All right, so that's distribution, so it's how are things arranged. All right, moving on. We have uh, these two terms, concentration and density. Concentration and density are very closely related. Concentration is just trying to tell you where can something be found. So in the example on the left, we see we're looking at a range of grizzly bears because 
who doesn't like a map about grizzly bears? I love them. We can see that anywhere that it's this burnt orange, right, we see that grizzly bears will range. The problem with concentration is it doesn't actually tell you where there are more grizzly bears or where there are less. You just know that a grizzly bear has been sighted there. Could be one, could be a million, right? Hopefully it's not. Now density is a more measurable tool used by geography. It shows you how, how often something occurs or um, how often it's occurring in a certain area. So this is a more useful grizzly bear map, right? So if we're in the lovely state of Montana, we can look here and we should know that we should never, ever, ever go to this area of Montana because, well, you see a lot of grizzly bear sightings in this area, right? We want to stay in the eastern portion of Montana, what I call the safe zone, all right? So this is how, this is how grizzly bears can um, uh, illustrate these two things, so please bear with us. Spatial interaction, we see that word spatial again. You're going to see it all year. Spatial just means over area, over just over space. I know, it looks like spatial. It's not spatial. It's spatial. So a spatial interaction is people <clears throat> interacting with other people or places across space. It's a very fancy, fancy word for something very intuitive. right? Globalization is basically spatial interaction, but across international borders complementary and transferability, right? These are two terms I really enjoy, right? The first one on the left is basically saying, why are two places, right? Really, we're saying complement with an E, right? Complement with an I is like, your eyes look beautiful, right? Oh my gosh, right? Your smile, your grin, that stuff. Complement with an E means that you go well together. So hopefully it's you and your partner, right? You all, you, you complement each other, right? So here's an example, right? Let's say in California, they're like, hey, we could use some bananas. Ecuador is like, hey, we could use some computers. So California, being a technopole, has an excess of computers. They have an excess of bananas. So what they realize is that just like you and your boyfriend or girlfriend, they're perfect for each other. And so therefore, they engage in a trade. So one ships the laptops, one ships the bananas back, and now we have a spatial interaction, right? It's a global interaction, and it's also complementary, all right? That's complementary. Transferability. On the same um, notions that it's how can you move something from one place to the other so we see accessibility already talks about how easy it is right but transferability it's on the same guys it's are you moving it and you can see from this description here known as time space compression we've gotten better at moving items so back right back in the day right our best speed was a horse-drawn carriage was about 10 miles an hour so that's how big the world is Right? This only goes to the 1960s. I wish I had a more modern one where you know Amazon drones are dropping things off like in your lap after you click, right? Buy now and all that. But you can see that the world is shrinking, right? From coaches down to locomotives to aircraft to jets to Amazon drones to in the future, um, I don't know, that thing they had uh, where it's just like holograms, right? They basically just create something right in front of you. Intervening opportunity. This is a phrase that means that basically if you've engaged in a relationship with someone or something, you will maintain that relationship unless a closer relationship a, a appears and presents itself. So um, let's look at, you know, this dapper Dan here, right? And this sweet girl, right? They have a relationship, right? And maybe they're trading something, who knows? However, if a closer opportunity appears, right? the farther one will be dropped, right? So all of a sudden, bay becomes x-bay, right? Closer bay becomes bay-bay. And now we can see that intervening opportunity. Now, this would probably be applied more in a business sense, right? You're trading with someone 100 miles away. All of a sudden, there's a similar business 50 miles away. You will drop 100 miles away and pick up the 50 mile away, right? And the last one are barriers. Barriers are anything you can think of that right? do not allow for diffusion, right? Remember, diffusion is the spread of an idea or a good moving it right across space. All right, and lastly, we have our last term. It's this weird one. It looks like some word for a horse, right, back in the mythical days, but it's ecumen. And ecumen is the places that are habitable. So where do people want to live, all right? And there's this kind of this platitude. It's people want to live, right, where it's not these five twos, right? So if it's too hot, people don't live there. If it's too cold, nah. Too wet, eh. Uh -uh. 
too dry or too high, people don't want to live there. Now, yes, people live where it's too hot and too cold and too wet and too dry and too high. They're called weirdos, all right? Normal people don't like to live in the extremes, right? So, yes, we can find exceptions to every rule. Just remember that those people are weird, right? And you should probably not talk to them. And with that, that is the conclusion of our first, right, unit. Uh, it's Interrelations of Place and Terms. And I want to thank you for listening today, all right? Yeah.